Which players are worth trading up for and what teams might be amenable to making those trades with the Utah Jazz in the 2023 NBA Draft? Find out next on Locked On Jazz. You are Locked On Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome into Locked On Jazz. My name is Leif Tuline, and I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk with you guys once again and filling in for David Locke for this week and a few weeks in the future. I'm a lifelong Utah Jazz fan who's a credentialed NBA draft analyst for Locked On NBA Big Board, attendee of the 2023 NBA Combine, jazz broadcast assistant and statistician over the past two seasons for the Jazz, lover of college basketball, and Big time numbers fan, so don't expect all of the geeky numbers of usual to be gone. But the all unique, I'll bring a unique perspective as a diehard college hoops fan, NBA draft analyst, and Jazz employee to make you as knowledgeable as possible entering a critical juncture for the Jazz with three picks this year and many more to come in the future. Thanks for making Locked On Jazz your first listen each and every day. And remember, Locked On Jazz is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube, at Locked On Jazz, where the best way to help us grow is to comment anything below. And today's question is, which player would you like to trade up for in the draft, if any? In the first segment today, I'll tell you which players, you know, player or players, I think there is enough value added to be worth trading up for. In the second segment, I'll tell you what teams make the most sense as trade partners for the Jazz. And there's a couple, so there is reason for optimism if you you think the value is high enough to trade up for. And in the final segment, I'll outline a few players I think the Jazz could look at in the offseason to solidify their roster or make a bit of a splash, uh, whether via free agency or via trade. Let's dive right into it. So first question, what players are worth trading up for? I want to clarify, despite yesterday's episode for the everydayers that tuned in, that you guys learned that there was a le- demonstrated lack of star power at picks 9 and 16 throughout the last 10 drafts. Um that's, it is weird to just choose a single spot and look at it, but there was a demonstrated lack of star power. I would argue the best two players were within their first three years of their career, uh, Jeremy Sohan and Alpern Shangun. Uh, both can be very nice players, and so that would actually add a, a reason to have optimism at nine. But I, but I will say this. Nine this year is a more of a, a better spot than it has been in years past because I think some of the guys that the Jazz could be interested in, if the ball the board falls – in a way that I expect it to, uh, making the Jazz want to trade up to try to get some of these guys with a little more star power. The guys at nine that that are still there have high floors because they have immediately impactful traits as opposed to being like swing picks. Uh, I'll use an example. I don't think Kevin Knox at nine made much sense. He went to Kentucky. He was long. He tested well in terms of measurements, and he had traits that people like. The other nine picks that had failed were like Trey Burke, uh, Frank Kaminsky, college player of the years that games didn't translate to what the NBA was, but they were getting drafted off their accolades in college. So this year, they're in a good spot because Taylor Hendricks, Cason Wallace, Anthony Black are all talented players. And even if my preferences lie for the Jazz going for Cam Whitmore or Jarris Walker, which I don't think will be there if they if they wait till nine, um, that does not mean that there aren't good players available at nine. Uh, that said, I think there is something to be said for trading up whether you get your guy all the way up to three for brandon miller or scoot henderson or or just up two or three spots for whitmore or walker i I think there's a difference between pick nine and pick six or seven uh i did did some digging for you guys like i said the best player at pick nine was jeremy sohan so far uh and if you don't want to take a rookie you can say yusuf nurkic good players but nothing that's going to move the needle um and there's just there was like too many busts at nine to feel confident, but that wasn't the premise of yesterday's episode. It was just talking about the history and how difficult drafting is. Uh, so let's just talk about pick seven. That's two spots up, and that might get you a play at one of Walker or Whitmore. Uh, here are the last 10 picks at number seven. Ben McLemore, Julius Randle, Emmanuel Moutier, Jamal Murray, Lowry Markinen, Wendell Carter Jr., Kobe White, Killian Hayes, Jonathan Kuminga, Shaden Sharp. Uh, I would say that's two picks up, nine to seven, and significantly players have been selected. So I feel like moving up at the Jazz, feel there is a divide between the top guys is wide enough from nine to you know who they perceive as six or seven, then then that is something worth doing. I mean, Julius Randle, 
Jamal Murray and Lowry Markin are all-star caliber players. Wendell Carter Jr. Uh, and Shaden Sharp are good players. And Shaden Sharp has the potential to be an all-star. Wendell Carter Jr. is a very solid starter in the NBA. Uh, Macklemore played a while. Moutier wasn't particularly great. Uh, Kobe White's still doing his thing. Kuminga, to be determined. Killian Hayes, not so great. That's that's a pretty good batch at seven, though. Uh, so that said, personally, I would target Jairus Walker, Cam Whitmore. Uh, I won't I won't cover. That's my preference for what the Jazz do. Uh, but I don't think either of them fall to nine, uh, barring some surprising picks. Uh, I think they do have a true possibility to be all stars, and that's what you really need to target if you're picking where the Jazz are picking, um, because we're not a free agency destination. As much as it would be awesome to be one, you got to build organically. And I think this is a draft where the Jazz have the assets and eight that allow you to move up. Uh, I think that the Jazz have the assets that you need to move up. And so if you're going to go full hog and try to accelerate the timeline, I think that's a good way to do it, moving up to the six or seven spot. And both six or seven, I'll talk about this later, the Magic and Pacers have a lot of picks, so I think they could be more amenable than you may think. You'd have to orchestrate it on their terms, obviously, because you're moving up to, for the coveted picks. But those are the two guys I would look for. Um, but the question is, is moving up two, three picks really going to give you enough additive value? What, what's the cost-benefit analysis of making a trade and, and having to hemorrhage a few more picks just for moving up two spots? Or well, at what cost comes with trading up you know, two, three spots, as I said, as opposed to trading up into the top four, presumably to take Brandon Miller, Scoot Henderson, or Amon Thompson. And is that additional price tag worth the chance to pick a guy that you think can become a franchise player, a Batman for your team? If the Jazz went for the franchise guy trading up to three, specifically if Scoot falls to three, I wonder if nine, 16, and 28 does the trick, or if two of those picks and a future does the trick. But likely the Blazers want established players, and uh, the Jazz wouldn't want to do that because the only guy the Blazers really have serious interest in would be Lowry Market. And that kind of moves the, moves the train off the rails. Uh, that said, you have the possibility of getting a franchise altering talent. Maybe they'd couple that with, uh, with uh, Shaden Sharp. You get number three, let's say it's Scoot Henderson and Shaden Sharp and Lowry Market. At least there's a conversation. I'm not saying that's what you do, but three, you know, the Blazers are looking to trade. Uh, even if you were to get Amon Thompson at four, I think the Rockets, they don't have a clear timeline. Maybe they'd be more interested than you'd think in a trade because, okay, they've got a lot of assets. You give them something they want. You give them future assets, and now they have more chances, more swings at the bat to, to hit, get their guy because they've found guys that are good but unspectacular. I think right now Jalen Green's their guy. Alfred Shangoon's been better than uh, advertised. Jabari Smith has had a hard time acclimating. Tari Eason's been good, but th there's there's room to margin there, uh, to wiggle there. Uh, I'd be curious to see if the Jazz would would try to make make a move up to the top and try to get themselves a franchise player that they think they can get in the top three. I'm not sure they will. I think it's more likely you move up two or three spots. Uh, the pick the picks you'd you'd give away wouldn't be as substantial, and you still get a guy that that you really like because I don't think the gap between Brandon Miller. And Cam Whitmore is as enormous as some others. I, I really think that that's closer and it's blown out of proportion how different of players they are. And for those of you who follow me on Locked on NBA Big Board, I have been Brandon Miller's ultimate fan the entire year. I, I said that Brandon Miller was the top college player before the season started. And that was not a popular take whatsoever. So this is not slight to Brandon Miller. I just think Cam Whitmore is better than people give him credit for. In sum, I think trading up could be a prudent move to help the Jazz accelerate into contenders sooner than what their timeline is presently set at. But coming up next, I'll tell you about which teams could be amenable trade partners for the Jazz should the Jazz elect to move up. But first, let me tell you about eBay Motors. For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So next time you need to move parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can make sure every part you need fits just right for the first time around. Just add your name, just add your ride to My Garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit or your money back. Because like in sports, confidence is the name of the game. And when you shop on eBay Motors and with 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, 
and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay, guaranteed fit only, available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Welcome back to Locked On Jazz. Thanks for making us your first listen. And every day, look forward to tomorrow's episode where I do a deep dive on the six prospects the Jazz should consider taking at 16. If you want, send me some of your on your wish list and I'll consider. I feel like I've got a good grasp of at least four of the ones I'm going to talk about tomorrow. And I'm, I'm willing to listen to ones you guys want to hear about for the other two. Right now, I'm going to go through the teams I view as the most conducive to do business with. In other words, who the Jazz should trade up with. For the first one is obvious to me. It's the Orlando Magic. Owners of picks 6 and 11, and they already have primary players in Paolo Bancaro and Franz Wagner. That's important because they're not looking to get this franchise altering talent. They have it in, in spades, in the front court, which is the most valuable place to have it, with ball handling bigs who can score, who can pass, who can defend. So they're less desperate to get a guy. Whereas if you're taking a team that's sixth, they're mediocre, but they have no like direction of who's going to lead their franchise, I doubt a team would trade. That's why the Magic make the most sense to me. Not to mention they have two picks here, so losing one of the picks doesn't hurt them as much, especially if you give them back a pick, or in this case, picks. Uh, what else is about the Magic that stands out? They're a bit redundant in their roster elsewhere. So making this pick is is like they're not feeling a glaring need. Like What they need is a shooter. Uh, so you could package players in this, but I think it would be a picks deal. So they may may go for like Taylor Hendricks at six because it fits their team the best. And I don't think Taylor Hendricks is probably their sixth best player on the board. He might be. He might be. But uh, maybe they go for Grady Dick at, at 11. And I think they, they know that if they're to trade down to nine from six, that they're going to get most of the players that fit their, their roster construction are still going to be on the board. And that's an important thing is you got to appeal to the opposite team if you're trying to move up. Obviously, they hold the, the upper hand in the negotiation because they have the most coveted pick. But that that's an obvious one for me to make a trade with because like they have two picks. They're redundant, but they're well-constructed right now. I, their guards aren't great, but I don't think any of the guards that they're looking at at six uh, are going to make you feel much differently about Mark Fultz, uh Jalen Suggs, Cole Anthony, all these guys. So I don't think that that changes too much. Their front court's pretty stacked. I'm, I've already talked about Wendell Carter Jr. being a good seventh pick and Paolo Bancaro and Franz Wagner being phenomenal. Uh, so let me let me just put out some trade ideas that I thought of. These are very unlikely to be exactly what transpires, but I, it's a framework that you could, you could think on. My ideal trade would be six for nine, and then it would be, it would be six for nine and 28, or nine and a future for six. I think that makes the most sense. Another possibility would be the Jazz moving up to 11 by coupling picks 16 and a future pick or 16 and 28. Should there be someone they really like making the magic doubly as appealing as a trademark partner? Because let's say the Jazz get someone they like at nine and they're like, wow, we can get this guy at 11. Okay, 16 and 28 seems worth it or 16 in the future. So the magic are my top trade partner. And I, and I think that's fairly easy to, to choose. I think they make the most sense as a trade partner. The other obvious trade option to me is Portland. It may not be straightforward because they want an established wing to complement Damian Lillard. The, the one that the Jazz have is named Lowry Markin. I don't think the Jazz are going to easily give up Lowry Markin. But there's a big but here. You need to have another team interested in a trade to make a trade. And uh, the Blazers want to trade. They've made this clear. When they didn't get Victor Wembanyama with the number one pick, they said, well, we're, we're interested in trading because... We want our timeline to include Damian Lillard. And Damian Lillard wants to win. And he's as loyal as they come, but you need to appease your star. So trading to get an established player makes more sense than picking a guy to immediately step in and be the Robin to Damian Lillard. I know they have Anthony Simons and Shaden Sharps growing in the wings, but that's at a position that is less important to the Blazers because they still have Damian Lillard. They want a wing. They want what has winning the NBA right now is, is having – wings and i know the nuggets are in the final so yeah he's an anomaly Jokic, Jokic helps you win too but they want a wing and so the one that they'd be interested in is lowry but the jazz wouldn't do lowry for three even if scoot henderson's there i you you may think about it but you won't do that because you're not doing it for a non-established player especially the way lowry's contract is very conducive to the team 
He loves Utah, and he fit in great in one year. But would the Jazz consider Lowry and Shaden Sharp, or uh, sorry, Lowry for three and Shaden Sharp, or Lowry for three and Anthony Simons? Possibly. I don't think this is uh, something that happens, but there there is a way that Jazz can be trade partners with the Blazers because the Jazz want to get a star in the draft, build organically. The Blazers want to trade. Maybe there's a three way trade that can be be constructed. I'm not sure who. I mean, the main name that you see tied to Portland right now is Mikel Bridges. So maybe there's a way to incorporate him. So I don't necessarily think that one happens, but you can't knock the the possibility of, of kicking the tires here because the Blazers want to trade. That That's half the battle. If you know that they want to trade, then you can at least kick the tires around, maybe incorporate a third team and make it a trade. Last option that I've picked out for the Jazz that I think makes sense as a trade partner and the more I think about it, there's a couple ways you could do this. The Indiana Pacers have four picks in the top 32. So they could be a team who are not operating, or sorry, who are operating in a similar way to the Jazz, both in terms of their timetable and in their drafting situation. They're not a huge market. They do have a player that I would consider a, uh, a near franchise player in Tyrese Halliburton. Uh, the Jazz have Lowry Markton, obviously. I think Halliburton's probably slightly more valuable because he's ball in hand. And he's, he's younger in his NBA tenure. Uh, they have pick seven. They have a couple other picks late in the first round. And then the 32nd pick. The Pacers. The Pacers have picked 26, 29, and 32. The Jazz, as you know, have 9, 16, and 28. So what do the Jazz do with that, that trade? I'm not sure. Maybe the Jazz could aim up to get seven, and the Pacers get nine, and the Jazz give up 16 for 26. So that would be seven and 26 for nine and 16. It's not terrible. Like, if, if the Jazz could get Jarris Walker, Cam Whitmore at seven with that pick, I, I'd be thrilled. I, and, and I like the 16 spot. I've, I've talked about this numerous times, and I'll talk about it tomorrow on the show. The guys that I like at 16, I think that's a that's a really good spot in this draft. There's a lot of talent there that I think will fall on the board because of the way teams orient their boards, not necessarily hurting the way the Jazz want to pick because they have so many options at 16. Um, you could also uh, try to trade into, you know, couple one of those later picks. Maybe you trade up to 26 and you get a player you want. Or maybe you trade down 28 and you get two of these later, uh, 29 and 32. A couple cracks of the bat. Now you get one guaranteed contract still at 29 just to pick down and you get a 30 second pick, a little less money and you have another crack of the bat. And so you can go one projectable player, uh, maybe maybe someone you see as a higher floor guy and then one you take a swing of the bat and aim for the fences and hope, hope you hit. It's happened. Uh, I think the key, like this is spitballing. I, I'm not sure what's going to happen. I wish I did now. I wish I could be a fly on the wall of Danny Ainge's meetings. But uh, this is some spitballing with teams with asset to match the Jazz. And who could be amenable to making the deals and coming up next? Like, I'll, I'll tell you, coming up next is, is I'm going to tell you who's available during free agency that I think could be impactful. But all of this is prognosticating. But you got to think about it from the framework of what makes sense. And those teams have the assets to match the Jazz that could make you interested in making a trade. Maybe they won't do it, but at least you have to have something tangible there to make the team interested in dealing with you. And if the Jazz have a specific goal of moving up, like I premised this episode, then you need to have the assets that the Jazz do, the futures and these year's picks, to make the teams interested in trading up with you. So I would not be surprised whatsoever if the Jazz deal with Orlando, Indiana, or Portland. Portland would surprise me a little bit, but I think there's a way that happens just because of knowing that they want to trade. So I think there's value in trading up. I really do. I, I want to go get someone that I think can help alter the franchise's course of history right now, make the playoffs. And I think there's guys in this draft that can do that. I'm less certain there's more than just good role players at nine. That's my take. So coming up next, I'll tell you who I think could be on their way to Utah via free agency, via trade, and, and how that would happen. Uh, but first, let me tell you about Murdoch Hyundai. Murdoch's have been in Utah for over 80 years now. Hyundai is the best car for your money, safety features, bells and whistles, uh, and all, in all their amazing cars. They're fancy, they look sleek, they uh, 
they're affordable. They, they make them in amazing prices. They look good and they're available. The SUV lineup from the Kona to the Tucson to the Santa Fe and the Palisade. Uh, there's, there's plenty and all of them are very good. I've heard rave reviews about them from people I know who have gone to Murdoch. Um, the, the Lonic 5 Electric was named the Motor Trend SUV of the year by Motor Trend. That's, that's impressive. But they, they rattle out these accolades so easily. The new Lonic 6 is amazing electric and looks just like a Porsche. That's the review you continue to hear on the website. And it just won World Car of the Year. Another accolade. Like nothing. They, they produce it so easily. Three locations in Linden, Murray, and in Logan. So make sure you check it out and get yourself a nice car. And please let us know how, how it's serving you in the comments. But check out Murdoch Hyundai at the very least. If you're looking at it for a new car like I am. And I'm actually getting a Hyundai coming up soon. As my car, as you may have heard, was in the shop for a long time. So I'm getting a Hyundai. And I'll let you guys know how that is as well. Welcome back for the final segment of Locked on Jazz. I'm Leif Tulin. And in this segment, I'm going to talk about established NBA players who could be making their way to Utah and how the Jazz could acquire them, whether it's via free agency or via the trade market. The sexy name around town is Jalen Brown. The Celtics are trailing, as I record this, 3-1 to one in the Eastern Conference Finals. Jalen Brown's had an underwhelming postseason, dealing with a nagging elbow injury. Jason Tatum gets all the acclaim. Jalen Brown doesn't shoot enough. Marcus Smart uh, takes a lot of the big shots that you would want to go to your number two player in Jalen Brown. So maybe he is irritated. Maybe he wants to go somewhere else. It's not entirely up to him, though. The Celtics would have to pay Tatum Brown nearly $100 million combined each year for the next six years, though, uh, because they're both all NBA. Tatum first team and Brown second team. That, that's a lot of money to commit to two players, especially if, if they're unhappy playing together. I'm not sure that's the case, but that's the way they're being painted. Uh, the Celtics will prioritize Tatum. That's another fact. Like You're going to take the guy that you think's better, also is younger. And I think Brown, there, there's a world where he wants to be the man on a team. And I think he could be. You typically in the NBA don't win unless you've got either the best roster by a wide margin or you got a top five player. I don't think Brown or Tatum at this rate are top five players, but you know, you're going to want the chance to be one. Um, so expecting to Brown, expecting to get Brown isn't something I'd do. Like it, it's unlikely as plenty of teams are in search for what he is. He's a two-way wing and he's, he's as good as they are. Like he's as good as they come as a two-way wing. And there are two teams that have more complete structures, more organizations conducive to winning. If they were to get Jalen Brown, immediately that they'd have a better chance of winning sooner than the jazz do that are going to be interested in him. And then it, what could the jazz give them, them being the Celtics that the Celtics would want. Um, maybe Jalen Brown would like to reunite with Danny Ainge, the guy who drafted him, took a chance on him in Boston, but do the Celtics want anything other than Lowry marketing? Like they've got Robert Williams already. So maybe that they probably don't want Walker Kessler Would the jazz give up Walker Kessler anyway. Probably not. The Jazz wouldn't give up Lowry Markin to get Jalen Brown and pay way, way, way more money. They want both of them. So I just don't see a way. Like the, the best the Jazz get out, give give the Celtics is future assets and Ochagbashi. And I don't see that happening. But I had to address the, the elephant in the room, which is the most appealing name. The other guys commonly linked to the Jazz are Cam Johnson and Kyle Kuzma. Cam Johnson's a restricted free agent, so the Jazz would have to likely a hefty sum of cash. But the Nets would have the ability to match and then they'd have to not match uh, for the Jazz to acquire services which to me means you'd have to overpay I think Cam Johnson's a nice player very very good shooter competes on defense uh, he's not doing a ton with the ball in his hand but he's a really really good role player I wouldn't want to overpay for him but if the Jazz are trying to make a move they got a fair amount of money it's not the worst thing Kyle Kuzma the appeal is he appended University of Utah and he intends on going through what he calls a real free agency process so he can play. Uh, he could be in play. Like maybe he wants to come back to Utah. Maybe he thinks that the Jazz will pay him more than some of the other places that would have him playing more of a role. Like I think he could have more of a starring role with the Jazz as they're still in the process of developing. Maybe the Jazz could draft a guard in that case if, if you get Kuzma and, or if you're intending to get Kuzma and you have a chance and now your roster is fairly complete. 
let's just say it's Case and Wallace, Ochag, Baji, Kyle Kuzma, Lowry, Marketing, and Walker Kessler. It's possible. Kuzma scored 21.4 points per game, 8.5 rebounds, and 3.6 assists, which will likely get him $25 million, maybe a little more on the market. Is he worth that sum of cash? I don't know. I really don't. In, in today's market, there's a lot of guys getting overpaid, and they're they're getting that amount of money. Is he worth it? Uh, my the way I typically view this stuff, I'd say probably not quite. But honestly, the way it, contracts are accelerating, he probably is. Like uh, those are really good numbers. Let me reiterate that: twenty-one, nine, and four from your small forward fits alongside with Walker Kessler and uh, Lowry Markkinen. Doesn't need the ball in his hands a ton to create. Has the ability to create on his own and hit open shots, rebound, puts forth effort defensively, and may like Utah because he attended college here. Worth a shot. Some other players I have interest in uh, that that I don't think have the names that generate buzz on the market that I went through this the, the free agency market, and it's, it's slim pickings, but I think the Jazz could be interested in. One is Kelly Oubre, who will have lower offers than expected due to injury from his past year. Uh, he's a c- productive player. I've always kind of thought he was a bit of an empty stat getter, uh, meaning that he, a lot of his numbers that you see in, in county stats come when in losing efforts. But uh, after a diminished value because his injury marred his season, maybe you take a, you take a little bit of a lesser contract and say, hey, Kelly Oubre, you want to – uh, work with our team, be in the rotation, but you're not going to play a starring role and you, we're going to have a chance to develop and win. I, I could see that. How much money does he get? I'm not sure. I doubt he'd come to Utah, but uh, it's worth a shot. Another one, Lonnie Walker won a game for the Lakers over the Warriors in the postseason that really helped them uh, keep control in that series. Uh, he's looking for more opportunities. I think Pete, because he had that game on, on a national stage and it was such an impressive game for uh, and it was like the Lonnie Walker game. I bet he prices out of the range that I'm I'm picking him in here. Like I was hoping to get him for you know eight million a year, and maybe maybe even less, because on on counting stats on value that he's put forth in the past couple of years, that would be a decent guy to bet on. He's got really good athleticism. He's young. He's willing to compete on defense. Uh, that's that's a guy that I would consider giving a little offer to. And lastly, this is a, a different style. Those were both wings with athletic upside. Um, Dwight Powell would be an interesting big. Mason Plumley's out there as well. I think both of these are luxury backup bigs, but I think both could be culture guys. You're seeing the importance of culture. Al Horford mentors the uh, – he mentors the Celtics. Kevin Love, Kyle Lowry, Udonis Haslam, and, and I could go on for all these guys who do a good job mentoring the heat you see guys on the nuggets like jeff green and and deandre jordan guys that are veterans and backup bigs who've seen a lot of basketball play with good players are are accepting lesser roles and and playing fewer minutes but being mentors i think dwight powell still got a fair amount left in the tank i've always been impressed with the fact that he finds the right spots to be he rebounds he he defends as best he can he's a lob threat uh, I, I wouldn't mind taking a, a little bit of money and saying, hey, Dwight Powell, we want you to be our backup big. And Walker Kessler is going to continue to get better. Can you just teach him the straight and narrow and how to get better at what he's doing? Uh, I don't expect Udoka Azabuki to be on the Jazz next year. I don't know who else the Jazz are going to be interested in playing the big. I mean, Luka Samanic, uh, you saw play the five at times, but I, I don't think that's the role for him in the future. I think he's a four. So I would say taking a backup big and seeing if you can get it for like a veterans minimum. I'm not saying that Powell would probably take that. I think he'll get more money elsewhere, but it's someone I'd extend an offer to. Well, that that's going to do it for me on locked on jazz today. Thanks for listening to today's trade centric show. And tomorrow, please tune in to hear the deep dives breaking down six prospects. I think the jazz will take long and hard looks at for pick 16. And with your second listen, Take a listen to Locked on NBA Big Board to hear my guys, Richard Stamen, Rafael Barlow, and maybe you'll hear me there if you're not too tired of me, uh, break down even more draft prospects, not for a specific team, just uh, as they are. And y- you'll you'll get great analysis there. Uh, Richard and Rafael are phenomenal. Met them in person in Chicago, and they do a great job. And, yeah, just tune in for tomorrow's show, and I hope you're enjoying. I'm having a great time talking with you guys. Until tomorrow, have a great day, and as always, go Jazz.